I might get started going. Um, good morning, everyone. This morning I'm talking about paediatric uh, tibial eminence fractures. Um, so I'm going to run through the background, the relevant anatomy, injury mechanism, the classification system, um, the workup of these, and management. So just a bit of a background. Um, so tibial eminence fractures, also known as tibial spine fractures, is basically a variant of an anterior cruciate ligament injury. Um, and this is in generally in the younger, um, skeletally immature population. Um, it results from failure of an incompletely ossified tibial evidence, and that's prior to ACL rupture. So the, an ACL rupture is kind of the adult um, version of this injury. <coughs> it was first described in about 1985 uh, by Ponsett, and Myers and McKeever um, described the surgical management of these injuries in 1959, and they also um, and divides the classification system. Epidemiology. So these are quite rare injuries. We don't see them that often. About three in 100,000 children per year. Um, it's usually in the skeletally immature children, um, most common age between 8 and 13 years. Um, these account for about 2 to 5 percent of pediatric knee injuries. Um, and about 14 percent of them have an associated ACL uh, ligament injury at the time. So just um, in terms of the anatomy, <coughs> so the tibial eminence or tibial spine is the non-articular portion. It's the eminent portion between the condylar surfaces of the medial and lateral tibial plateau. Um, and the medial spine acts as the broad attachment point for the ACL, and this is about 10 to 14 millimetres um, behind the anterior body of the tibia. <coughs> um, the ACL fans out from the tibial em eminence, and it coalesces with both the anterior horn of the medial and the lateral meniscus. Um, and these are attached, and um, there's the transverse intermeniscal ligament. And these are important um, when we come a bit later on to management and reduction because it's these soft tissues, um, the anterior horns of the menisci, and the transverse intermeniscal ligament that can get interposed in the fracture fragment and block reduction. Um, <clears throat> and if uh, to force, um, force is sufficient to the fracture, um, the tibial eminence, it places strain often on the ACL. Um, and it can lead to attenuation of a ligament, but rarely a rupture. So just looking at the anatomy of the, uh, the tibial plateau itself, um, as we know, we've got our medial and lateral meniscus, and this is the transverse intermeniscal ligament. Um, so the tibial evidence is underneath here. This is your ACL here. Um, and it's the anterior horns of the menisci and this ligament that can get interposed in the fracture fragment. <coughs> the injury mechanism. Um, so it's the same typical mechanism as it would be for an ACL in an adult. Um, it's a slower loading traction type injury. Typically it's a, a hyperextension or a severe vagus or varus um, uh, twisting type injury to the knee. Um, commonly seen or due to sports injuries. And it's traditionally been described in children as occurring from bike accidents um, and also skiing um, and usually with hyperextension of the knee. <coughs> Um, the increased incidence among children is hypothesized due to the, the relative uh, weakness of the um, incompletely ossified tibial eminence um, compared to the ACL fibers, and therefore the eminence gives way, um, whereas you can get attenuation um, of the ACL fibers, but they rarely break um, as they would in the adult. Uh, so the classification system is Mayer and McKeever's. Um, generally, so May and McKeever described this classification in 59 and they broke it up into type 1, 2 and 3 um, and this is in relation to the displacement of the avulse frag uh, fragment. So type 1 is completely non-displaced. Type 2 generally has an anterior displacement but the posterior hinge is still intact. Um, type 3 is further subclassified. Um, this is when you have complete displacement um, but type A um, is usually um, uh, fracture at the ACL insertion. Um, whereas type B uh, encompasses the entire intercondylar eminence. Um, and then Da Kinji, in, uh, that, sorry, that should say 1977, not 1997, um, then further um, added in a type 4 classification, um, and this is uh, when the fragment is commonly referred to. Um, the ratio of the fracture of the anterior eminence um, to fracture of the posterior eminence is about 10 to 1. So it's very uncommon to see a fracture of the posterior eminence. It's usually the anterior aspect. Um, and about 40% of these are associated with uh, 
work on um, community injuries, so your soft tissue injuries, so meniscus, capsular, collaterals, and osteochondral fragments or fractures. So clinical features, typically the presentation is going to be a kid will turn up with a, a painful knee hemoarthrosis with limited range of motion and difficulty weight bearing, um, and they'll usually describe um, a sudden onset of swelling and pain at the time of the injury. Um, to examination, they'll usually have a, a boggy swelling with a, a tense joint um, which is tender to palpation uh, with reduced range of motion. Um, they may have a positive anterior jaw, um, however it's usually difficult to examine this in the acute setting due to pain. Uh, if you took them to theatre and did an EUA, um, most of them would have a blocked full extension. Um, and then obviously if, if you're <coughs> able to, depending on pain of the child, you can examine for other uh, ligamentous injuries. So working these up, um, imaging, so plain films, AP, lateral and notch view. Um, the lateral is the most important in this case um, because that gives you an idea as to the uh, displacement of the fragment and the size of the fragment. Um, CT is uh, useful in looking at the bone and anatomy um, and determining the degree of combination displacement which will help decide in the management of these. And obviously MRI um, is useful in looking at the non osseous uh, uh, associated injuries, so your ACL um, or municipal injuries, and also looking at the physis, um, as is mostly uh, silly, silly to interrupt. <laughs> and this, as I said, allows for preoperative planning. Um, and some uh, authors have said that um, using high resolution MRI may eliminate the need for CT, which obviously has a, a high radiation dose in children. Um, and it's important to note that the majority of all these fractures are usually musculitally immature. Mm -hmm and therefore the actual fracture fragment um, may be significantly larger than what you can see on the x-ray uh, because obviously um, a lot of it hasn't ossified yet. Um, so this is just an AP and lateral view of a, uh, a type 3 um, to the MS fracture. As you can see, most appreciated on the lateral view um, of the fragments completely displaced. Um, and then this is an MRI uh, scan of a 10-year-old boy who sustained a, a smear eminence fracture. Um, so again, um, a grade 3 or type 3. But as you can see, the ACL is intact, but he does have some bruising of the, uh, of the lateral femoral condyla. So the management of these really depends on the, the type of the fracture in terms of the classification, um, any entrapment of soft tissues and associated knee injuries. Um, and the goals and management of these is to achieve anatomical reduction, uh, particularly restoring um, congruity of the tibial plateau um, and of the eminence itself, um, uh, achieving continuity of the ACL fibres, um, if there's any injury to those, uh, rigid fixation in order to allow early range of motion um, to try and prevent uh, stiffness in the knee later on, and to eliminate any extension blocks and impingement of soft tissues to get that good anatomical reduction. Uh, so type 1 injuries, so these are the non-displaced, so these are managed non-operatively, um, generally in a long leg uh, cylindrical calf, um, and immobilization is typically for six weeks. There is some controversy in the literature. Um, it does depend a little bit on the age of the patient, um, so some authors describe anywhere from two to six weeks of immobilization. Um, in terms of position of the knee within the calf, again, this is a bit controversial in the literature. Most authors um, recommend uh, having the knee at 10 to 20 degrees of flexion. However, some uh, say you should have an incomplete extension or even hyperextension in order to bring the condyles down to reduce that fracture and hold it reduced. It's important with these to monitor uh, for displacement because a number of them can displace um, and late displacement uh, poses quite significant difficulties in reducing these arthroscopically and you sometimes need to open them. Um, so they recommend usually two weekly x-ray reviews. Um, and at the six-week mark, they have an aggressive rehab protocol similar to an ACL protocol um, to try and avoid stiffness. Uh, type 2 fractures, um, a little bit of controversy in the literature for these. Generally, most of them are non-operative managed, um, certainly at least initially. Um, these are taken to theatre for aspiration of the hemoarthrosis and then a closed reduction. Um, and this is done by extending the knee, which allows the femoral condyle to reduce the fragment. Um, similarly, these are immobilised generally in a cylindrical cast, um, sometimes in a hinge knee brace, are uh, locked. 
Um, however, loss of reduction is common in about um, 50%. Um, and this increases risk of instability and, and loss of full extension later on. And so these warrant surgical intervention. Um, however, at the time of uh, reduction in theatre, if, if there's persistent displacement or you're unable to reduce, um, and 54% of the time this is due to that interposition of the soft tissues, um, then um, arthroscopic reduction and internal fixation is then warranted. So as mentioned previously, some of the blocks that cause reduction, um, typically it's the anterior horns of either the medial or lateral meniscus, um, the intermeniscal ligament, or also a, a bucket handle mechanism of the lateral meniscus. And this is when um, <coughs> excuse me, the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus um, comes free from the, its insertion on the tibial plateau, um, but is still attached uh, to the ACL. And as the L ACL displaces upwards with the fragment, then the lateral meniscus uh, has a, a bucket type effect and gets stuck within the fragment. Management of type 3 and type 4 um, are always surgically managed. Um, there's been an evolution in time. Um, uh, originally, they were managed conservatively, non operatively, <coughs> and then there was a trend towards open reduction, internal fixation, and now we're seeing um, these are generally arthroscopically managed. Um, there are various described methods in terms of uh, fixing these, and this is with either screw fixation, anterior or retrograde. Um, sutures, suture anchors, or even K wire and tension band wiring, which I'll touch on in a minute. Just comparing the results of some of the type of fixation methods. Um, so there was uh, McLennan um, in '95 did a series of type 3 fractures um, looking at closed reduction versus arthroscopic reduction um, versus arthroscopic reduction and fixation. Um, and some of the knee scores, so your patient reported outcomes and clinician uh, measures. Um, were highest, meaning they scored better, so had a better outcome in arthroscopic reduction and fixation compared to just closed reduction. Um, anterior laxity of the ACL um, afterwards uh, was lowest, again, in the arthroscopic uh, reduction and fixation compared to just closed reduction. And second look arthroscopy um, revealed fracture fragment displacement um, was higher in the closed reduction groups. So should we use open versus arthroscopic? Um, most people will arthroscopically do these these days. There are no studies in the literature that directly compare open versus arthroscopic. Um, so it's hard to say um, you know, which is better. Um, there are only studies saying the, the pros and cons of each. Um, obviously, an, an open reduction allows direct visualisation um, and therefore seeing whether there's any interposition within the fracture site to allow free matter. Um, but arthroscopy is recommended prior to this anyway to evaluate for associated soft tissue injuries. Um, arthroscopic uh, is more technically challenging, however, obviously, there's minimal dissection and disruption to the surrounding tissues. So, which fixation method is best? Um, there's a few comparative studies in the literature um, which recommend which fixation method is best. Um, the majority of these are very small case study series with short follow-up and level 3 or 4 evidence. Um, but screw and suture fixation are the commonest methods employed. Um, in deciding which to use, you have to consider the nature of the fracture, particularly the size of the fragment, um, the degree of the skeletal maturity of the child, um, so that you don't damage the physis, and also the surgeon expertise and what they're comfortable with doing. So suture fixation, um, it's generally used for small fragments for which you can't get a, a screw through um, or when there's comminution of the fragment and it is gleefully immature so that you're not crossing the fighting. Um, you generally can use either absorbital, absorbital um, or permanent or fibre wire. Um, the pros of this are with suture fixation. Um, it's a secure fixation method. There's no hardware to re remove later and it does avoid the physis, however it is technically demanding. Um, so this is uh, the technique that's used. Um, so you have your standard setup for a knee scope with your um, medial and lateral uh, portals. Um, and then you uh, use your standard ACL type jig um, to do your two tibial tunnels ad adjacent to the tibial footprint. Um, this picture here, it's probably a little bit hard to appreciate, but this is the drill coming up. Um, drilling the, the tibial tunnel. Um, and then you pass a suture typically through the ACL substance. You can also pass it through the fracture fragment itself. 
and this is the suture coming through the ACL here. Um, and then you loop it through and bring it down through the tibial tunnels, um, usually with a, a suture passer. Um, and then you, uh, you reduce it with the knee fully extended um, to get good um, uh, tension. And, uh, and then it's usually tied around a bony bridge um, at the kind of the end of the tibia. Um, there is variability in the technique for securing the, the suture and also in passing and achieving uh, the sutures. Again, um, this is just a picture demonstrating uh, the jig for drilling the two tibial tunnels. Um, generally, there's one on the medial and lateral side of the ACL uh, footprint, um, and then you pass it through like this, um, usually in a figure eight, and then tie it out with a bony bridge at the front of the anterior tibia. Um, screw fixation um, can either be anterograde or retrograde, uh, most commonly is anterograde. Um, typically, use a cannulated screw um, because it allows um, uh, better um, fixation of the uh, fracture fragment at the time and, and maintain a good reduction as you get the screw in. Um, the fracture fragment should be about three times the size of the screw um, in, a, in order to try and avoid um, further fracturing that fragment. Uh, the pros of this is less demanding. Um, you can possibly get early immobilisation and weight bearing um, and authors say because of um, more secure fixation. However, there are no studies that prove that this is the case over suture fixation. Um, the cons, obviously, you can get hardware irritation, pull out of the screw, um, impingement if the screw is improperly placed, and then therefore you might require a second procedure down the track to remove that. Um, and there is also a high risk of fissure damage. Um, you can, however, place the screw in order to try and avoid the fissures. Um, so similarly, um, in terms of the technique, you stand a knee type approach with your uh, medial lateral portals. However, you have a superior um, needle uh, portal as well, um, for which you pass the guide wire down through the fracture fragment um, to hold it reduced, um, and then you over drill, and then you uh, pass the cumulated screw over through that, um, typically in the anterograde fashion. Um, and this is a, a post operative x ray showing that. Um, when you do have a skeletally immature uh, patient, you can use shorter screws. Um, and typically you angulate the screw more horizontal to try and uh, pull up short of the fissures so that you're not crossing it posteriorly. Um, so which is better, suture versus screw fixation? Um, there are a number of studies that have been done looking at this. Um, uh, Tuz Tata in 2005 looked at the biomechanics um, in comparing uh, these fixation methods. Um, and show that there's a, a uh, increase in the degree of anterior, uh, sorry, the anterior tibial translation with suture fixation uh, versus uh, anterograde screw fixation, um, which indicates that biomechanically it's probably not quite as sound. Um, Eggers in 2007 um, looked at this in four sign knee models, so whether it can correlate through to the uh, into children. Um, so that under cyclic loading, suture fixation has greater strength um, than screw fixation, and the screw generally failed earlier. Um, Bong in 2005 um, showed that in terms of the ultimate load failure um, was higher um, in using fiber wire sutures rather than uh, cannulated screws, which is similar to what Eggers um, uh, showed in terms of that um, the screw fixation generally fails earlier. And then Hunter and Wills in 2004 uh, show that there's about a 44% of reoperation rate in screw fixation, and about half of this is attributable to um, pull out of the screw or not being placed in the right position and then causing impingement and further um, damage, condor damage in the knee. Um, just briefly, so Faisal sparing methods. Um, obviously, sutures are um, preferred in this um, age group because they do avoid the physis. However, some authors have said that um, theoretically um, sutures spanning across an open physis could cause heavy growth. Um, however, this is not often seen. Um, <coughs> screw fixation should be uh, inserted under IR, um, as mentioned, with a horizontal positioning in an AP plane. Um, however, um, authors have shown that <coughs> even when screws do cross the physis, uh, there has been no clinical uh, consequence following violation of physis. Post-op rehab, usually it's an excellent prognosis in these children. 
Um, as I said, the period of immobilisation is quite controversial. A study in 2012 by Patel um, comparing range of motion therapy after four weeks as opposed to after eight weeks um, showed that those that were returned to activities and functions within four weeks had a better result, um, which decreased instances of stiffness and arthrofibrosis. Generally, you start them off touch weight bearing and gradually increase them to weight bearers tolerated. Um, it's an ACL type protocol and you can usually resume sports within about four to six months. Just briefly, considerations of the ACL. So typically in these injuries, um, the ACL remains intact. Um, as I said previously, about 14% have an injury of the ACL. Um, there's often some degree of intri intrinsic structural damage and this usually happens at the time of the injury because you get some um, attenuation of the, the substance within of the ACL fibres. Um, in about, uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but laxity is objectively noted um, on follow-up of type 3 injuries um, in maybe about 50%. However, complaints or subjective instability is infrequently noted. So even though there is um, often um, some uh, laxity of the ACL clinically, um, most patients uh, don't notice it and they are asymptomatic. Um, and Willis uh, in 2003 did a long-term follow-up of 60 skeletally immature patients um, and they reported no subjective instability um, despite 74% of them having signs of laxity on um, arthromatous testing. Um, and just to finish up, complications. Um, the most common complication is ACL laxity. Um, the instance is about um, 10%, sorry, I said a bit higher before, 10% in these managed surgically, whereas 20% managed non-operatively. Um, but as mentioned, the majority are clinically asymptomatic and don't need any further intervention. Um, loss of motion, which is uh, usually in uh, these treated uh, surgically, so type 2 and type 3, is due to arthrofibrosis or malunion, um, and this uh, causes a block to full extension. Um, implant irritation and prominence, um, as you can see here, this screws back down and causes a block to full extension and also can cause uh, chondral uh, wear and damage and also growth disturbance, which is quite rare. 